yeah. say the whole thing. Sorry. And I'm so glad that we caught into the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's proven right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just wonder how many addicts around town have bad yeah. syndrome. So I was at the NAACP convention, in one of the which is why I missed the last one. And then Biden showed up. And I leaned over to Latricia. I'm like, Sycamore. I really yeah, hope he comes down and has no good combo. And did something to talk. Like build an and then like three days later, it happened. <laughs> and that would have been the place to do it. How was it in that, when he was speaking? It was pretty great. Uh, he still like loved a lot of things, but they were mm -hmm. minor. Um, yeah. Especially with the way that she was talking. Yeah, he messed up one thing where he called up her, it was an absolute value, and he called it a percentage, which would have been a totally different number and did not correct. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Franklin? Here. Ms. French? Here. Mr. Prethridge? Here. Ms. Ragu? Here. Mr. Bracken? Here. Mayor Snavely? Here. Okay, we will now do the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like to join us, you're welcome to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty Justice Thank you very much. I would then entertain a motion to approve tonight's agenda. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. We'll now move to public participation. And the first item is appointments to boards and commission. We have one opening <coughs> that we're able to fill tonight on the Historic and Architectural Preservation Commission. Uh, nominate Aaliyah Wegner to Historic and Architectural Preservation. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. And one abstention. Okay. We will then move to other public comments. So anybody who would like to address council about items that are not on tonight's agenda or if it's on the consent agenda, Please come forward and give us your name and address for the record, and we'll give you five minutes. Okay, seeing no one, we'll move to the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve it? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any items to be removed? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And we will move then to resolutions. You can read the first one. A resolution authorizing the city manager to sign the subgrant agreement between the City of Oxford and Habitat for Humanity of Greater Cincinnati to award $500,000 of Butler County American Rescue Plan Act funds for affordable housing infrastructure. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Jessica, welcome. Good evening, Council and Mr. Mayor. The next three resolutions are all related to the same topic, so I'm gonna give my staff report in general and then step aside. We also have um, Joe here from Habitat for Humanity if you would have any detailed questions. So, um, This first one is for a subgrant agreement as part of the Butler County um, ARPA funds. If you remember, they asked for us to apply for additional funds for to serve disparate populations. And we applied for $1 million um, to help both of our um, housing projects, both Habitat for Humanity and the Cottage Community. This is for $500,000 for Habitat for Humanity to be used for infrastructure. The next resolution is the Ohio Department of Development Welcome Home Ohio Grant. And this application was for $30,000 for construction assistance per unit. Um, the application from Habitat is up to 38 units, but to be on the safe side, we applied for 33 and were awarded. And so that sub -grant agreement is in here as well. And then the final resolution is the development agreement with Habitat for Humanity. And this development agreement includes their proposal um, in response to our request for proposals that we reviewed with HAC and brought forward to the council for adoption um, to approve to work forward with them. This is the agreement that we've drafted to work together. Um, it creates their obligations to create um, 
townhomes um, up to 38. It um, requires them to go through our planning process. It requires them to have an affordability period and to serve residents up to 80% area median income. Uh, it requires them to have a homeowners association um, and to take care of the property, the green space and things like that. So I am um, happy to answer any questions that you will have. Um, Habitat is here as well. Appreciate it. So here's what we're going to do is I will ask for public comments and then we will vote on each one of those and Jessica and our representative from Habitat will be here in case there are questions on each one. So that's the game plan. So let's uh, go for the first one. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this uh, resolution? Yeah, come on up, Steve. Steve Schnabel, 44 Autumn Drive. Uh, I also have the pleasure of serving as a chair by your appointment of the Housing Advisory Commission and wanted to let you know how important uh, this entire development is. So all of the resolutions related to this topic rather than me coming up multiple times, uh, just wanted to, to tell you that the uh, commission is very supportive. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Steve. We appreciate it. Is there anyone else who would like to address it? Any discussion on the first one by council? Fantastic. I'm so glad this is moving forward. This is, yeah, yep. super. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. And we'll go to the second one. You can read it. A resolution authorizing the city manager to sign the subgrant agreement between the city of Oxford and Habitat for Humanity to award $990,000 of the Welcome Home Ohio funding through the Ohio Department of Development. Okay, and we've had that described to us. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Is there a motion to adopt? So made. Second. The moved and seconded. Is there any discussion by council? What? Well, I just want to, um, among all the good things about all this, that we're able to pull down almost a million dollars in state funding for exactly what we're trying to do. Was there any local match to this? Or? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's just the, the power of that grants personship beyond being entrepreneurial, having a plan, having a project to fund, and finding that funding, and that there are fun funding pools available. This is huge, you know, to slice $30,000 off the, the cost of each unit. Everything we do is bringing those units um, closer to affordability. And so thank you to everybody who was involved in finding that funding and applying for it. So it's fantastic. And I would like to publicly thank Sarah Carruthers, who helped us get that through the state process. Okay. And we appreciate whenever we get a little bit of assistance from our representatives. So thank you very much on that. Anyone else? I, I have a question, and congratulations. I, I remember on Housing Advisory when you were talking about applying for this and fingers crossed and all of that. So you mentioned that you had capped it at 33 units rather than 38 to, on the, to be on the safe side. Was that because the extra $150,000 might have made it a less competitive award, or what was? Our nervousness came more for Habitat needed to go through the Planning Commission process, and there were things like retention ponds and space for emergency vehicles that we weren't quite sure, like, could they, could they build the entire 38 units? And so instead of having to give funds back, we decided to be a little bit more cautious and apply it for a little bit less. Thank you. And this is just a question. It's just dawning on me now. I mean, what we're, what we're doing here is we're piloting a way for the city to partner with developers to build affordable housing. Would funding like this work, for example, if there were a private developer who wanted to build affordable housing in our community, could we partner the same kind of way or does it have to be a nonprofit? It doesn't have to be a nonprofit, but there are quite a few restrictions built into the Welcome Home Ohio grant that are very unique. Um, there's financial literacy education courses. There's um, courses, uh, there's um, a max of what you can sell the house for. There's uh, an affordability period that it has. So like, for example, if someone buys a home and then they move out in seven years, the next 
person who buys it has to be sold to you at an affordable rate as well. And so those conditions are much more difficult for a private developer, but it was uniquely situated for a Habitat for Humanity who does this already. And so will this pool of funding be available for future projects or is it a one-time deal? I don't know. Okay, thank you. I was just gonna say the other issue with private developers is that the savings aren't necessarily handed down to those who need it in all situations. Whereas when we work with somebody like Habitat, we know that's the case. So. Yep. Well, we have a good history of working with Habitat. Yep. We're glad to welcome them back again. And I would entertain a vote. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted. And you can read the third one. A resolution authorizing the city manager to sign and enter into the development agreement outlining the proposed development to be constructed by Habitat for Humanity of Greater Cincinnati at 601, 603, and 607 West Chestnut Street. Okay, is there a motion to adopt it? So moved. Second. Thank you. And we've had a discussion um, by Jessica. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this or ask a question? Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. And we will move into council. Do you have any comments or questions on this one? So this is the development agreement. Just gratitude to whoever. There's a lot of detailed <laughs> language, some of which might be boilerplate, but some of which might be new language to us. And so I appreciate our law staff or whoever. Like, there's a lot of detail in this, so I can see the time that went in and care went into this development agreement. It took a lot of reading. Yes. <laughs> it did. A lot in there. I do have a question related to some of this. So um, if you or maybe Joe could explain the 20 year affordability period and then Jessica, I remember at our HAC meeting, you talked about a seven year period if somebody sold within seven years and so. So the seven year period was an example. Okay. Um, and I will let Joe speak to how the 20 year affordability period works. Okay. But in layperson speak, if a person is in the home and they sell it before 20 years, it will be required to sell to another income eligible buyer. Um, and he can explain the mortgages. But then after 20 years, um, part of the Habitat model is you know, home ownership. And so they will be able to fully own that home outright and in the future sell it. Um, at market they, rate. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Joe, you want to introduce yourself? For sure. Uh, my name is Joe Hansbauer. I'm president and CEO of Habitat uh, for Humanity of Greater Cincinnati. Uh, you, you know, just a quick thank you. I mean, we, you know, we're we're excited uh, to be uh, doing doing this work uh, in Oxford and, and continuing uh, the work that uh, that we've already done um, on the uh, affordability. Um, so there will be uh, at the time of sale. Um, so all of these will be fee simple uh, sales to uh, low to mod income qualified uh, home buyers. Um, and at the time of sale, there'll be a deed restriction uh, that runs with the land uh, that requires all future sales uh, to be uh, to qualified low to mod income uh, home buyers for a period of 20 years from the initial sale. Um, we, in addition to that, uh, put a uh, second mortgage uh, on the home that's a forgivable mortgage that forgive that is forgiven over the same time period, uh, so that if uh, for some reason. Uh, that uh, deed restriction at the time of closing in the future uh, wasn't adhered to, uh, the mortgage sale would still happen uh, and we would be able to recoup the subsidy that went into the home to create another affordable home ownership opportunity for someone. Uh, we don't expect that to happen, but it's just kind of a second, secondary backup that we, that we put on it. Okay, so if somebody bought, let's say it changed hands a couple of times, one unit, mm -hmm. somebody bought it at year 19, does the clock, the clock does not reset for them? No, it's 20 years from the from original the initial sale. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any further questions? How, Thank I, you, Joe. Oh, I do have one more question for you. How does the advertising go as far as like which neighborhoods or regions will be learning about these properties? So uh, as, so we underwrite our own mortgages. Uh, so uh, by fair lending laws, uh, these homes will be marketed uh, and available for anyone that's interested uh, that might know of the availability and, and the creation. They'll be able to submit a, an application uh, to partner with Habitat on the purchase of a home. Um, we, re we review that the same way as uh, anyone walking into a bank and requesting a mortgage would. Um, so it, it requires us to do the 
all the fair lending laws, 30-day 30, 30 requirement for us to respond to any request. Um, so that is, you know, in general, this will be available uh, anywhere. Um, we will target uh, and communicate uh, the availability of these homes uh, in partnership with the city. So, so certainly, uh, we want to create home ownership opportunities for folks uh, that are already in the community that don't have and haven't had the opportunity uh, to own homes um, as, as a primary uh, target, right? So um, we'll be doing outreach in the community uh, as we get a little bit closer through the planning uh, phase uh, and, and start marketing those homes. Um, we'll do uh, open uh, events uh, to explain our process and model uh, to communicate uh, the availability of the homes. Does that answer it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just okay. imagining what it would look like. Like if it would be like going into specific neighborhoods and speaking to a certain population or. So I'm really excited to kind of help market the availability of these homes and some of our initial plans are to work with the Human Resources Department of Schneider Electric, Talawanda Schools, um, Miami University, um, and McCalla High and different employers around town and say, do you know this is available? And just for the public and for anyone's general awareness, if you want to see if you or someone who you know may be eligible for this, on page 48 of our agenda is a table yeah. that is by family size and minimum income and maximum income monthly. And this um, is kind of a good indicator if you should at least express interest. And um, that's what we'll be using and we're excited to help them market the properties. Well, if I could, I mean, I think it was really, I think it's because I think people may think about Habitat for Humanity and think about only about low income. But according to this table, that, that it could range from an income of 56000 for a single person up to $80, um, $81,000 a year for a family of four. You know, and so that's moder That's workforce housing in our community. You can imagine a lot of people who are operating. And so, yeah, I look forward to serving a variety of people's needs. Um, with this housing, so I think that's really exciting. Now are we ready? Can I ask one more thing? Yes. Sir? Yeah. Uh, how early should people be applying mm. for these potential yes, homes? waiting lists. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, typically speaking, um, we uh, promote the address and the home model that we will we build, we will be building uh, roughly six months in advance of putting shovel in the ground, um, and because of the Welcome Home Ohio uh, funding, which we are uh, certainly gracious for, um, it's a pretty tight timeline, right? So uh, we, we need, uh, in order to access those funds, uh, the, the homes need to be built uh, by uh, May of 26. Um, so we're gonna be building a bunch of houses here in the next uh, 20 months or so. Is there a requirement that the um, owner reside in the residence? There, yeah, there is. There, there's That's a primary important. residency uh, requirement. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, that was my question. <laughs> Last question, am I the only one who like, can't stop smiling when you hear this story? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that the more we talk about it, I think that like the community needs to know, I mean, I. I I have trouble imagining or remembering a development like this that came online that met the needs of people like that. It also I think meets there's going to be a goal. waiting list on this for sure. Yeah. Um, and my last question is, are there kind of the sweat equity requirements that I typically associate with, or is this like a market property someone could buy and turn the key and walk in? Uh, this, these will all be uh, Habitat Partnership homes. So okay. uh, first time home buyer, 30 to 80% AMI, uh, 30 uh, percent debt to mortgage ratio, 40 percent uh, debt to income ratio, uh, and uh, 60 hours of homeowner education uh, and financial education, and 200 hours uh, of sweat equity and volunteer uh, on the home bills. It's awesome. Worth it. Thank you very much, and I I apologize for speaking over you, but it does support council's goal of housing for everybody and it's a, another way for us to get to that point and we thank you and, and our partnership with habitat in that way all those in favor indicate by saying aye aye, aye. opposed and the resolution is adopted thank you very much congratulations joe and we will move to the fourth resolution a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute an economic development transfer form from 
the Division of Liquor Control for Cherry Tree Marketing, LLC. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded, and Doug? Yes, so the state of Ohio has established a TREX transfer process as a tool for economic development. This process allows liquor permits that are traditionally quota restricted to be moved from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, so the business acquires an alcohol permit via this TREX transfer process. It's held to the same standards as the other uh, liquor <coughs> permit holders. Uh, so this proposed legislation then is requesting approval to transfer a liquor permit from a business in Cincinnati, Urban Access, uh, to Cherry Tree Marketing LLC, which is uh, located at 327 West Spring Street in Oxford. So by utilizing this process, the owner at this location would be able to obtain a D5 liquor permit. So the site, as you know, has undergone a lot of improvements over the last year, transforming the, uh, from a filling station and convenience store to a quick service restaurant. Uh, under this transformation, significant investment has been made in the property by both the property and the business owners. With this uh, input from staff, with input from staff and the planning commission, this site underwent uh, significant improvements to the facade, uh, outdoor dining area and improve pedestrian safety uh, and we think this will benefit the Locust Street corridor. So approval of this trix transfer uh, requires uh, uh, council's approval that you know we're basically saying we agree and approve this process and this would help support this business and the investment that have been made in this property. So and if you have any questions I'd be glad to answer them. Okay. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this resolution? Councilors have any questions? I have one, so go ahead. I was just going to say, what, I'm sorry that Urban Axe Rowing has lost their permit in Cincinnati. I guess that's where it came from, was an axe rowing place in, over the Rhine. Their loss is our gain, I guess. So I was wondering what Urban Axe's was. Yeah, I don't really know much about the business. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's just a transfer of yeah, their liquor system. license uh, to the city of Oxford. So, you know, we have a quota system for the D permits. Uh, and uh, so basically, once we reach that quota, they can't issue any more permits. So this allows uh, a business to obtain a D5 permit, which I'm sure they, they had to pay be. for that. They pay for it. Uh, you know, there's a, a secondary market for liquor licenses. Yes, you pay is. the state for the liquor license, but then they can sell it. Uh, so at, at if after price. some period of time, these people <laughs> decided that they were going to go out of business, um, they would still hold the liquor permit and could sell it. Um, well, I'd require if, if I believe, and I think this is true, I believe if they try to sell it, they have to still come back to us, the new owner, even okay. if it's at the same location. All right. And I definitely know if That's, it's at a that different was my location. Question, yeah, so. It has to come back to us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there, did I ask? Is there anybody from the public who wanted to talk about this? Okay. Is there any counselors who have questions or comments? Yeah. So just to, I, Bill, I've had a very similar train of thought. Um, so just to be extraordinarily clear, when this, when we approve the transfer of this liquor license to Oxford, should Brickhouse Cafe, I wish them all the best, but should they go under, that liquor license then stays in Oxford, keeping us over our quota. It does not revert back to Cincinnati. If they go out of business? Right. right. So if they, right, if their business folds. I mean, right. they, they can put a liquor license in a, in a whole pattern, but if they okay. try to transfer it to another location okay. or another owner, it has to come back to the city okay. council. Cool. If they wanted to go back to Cincinnati, they'd have they'd to have go to, the the same. to get them to okay. accept yeah. the transfer. Okay, thank you. All right, are we all set? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Resolution is adopted and we will move to ordinances first reading. An ordinance amending section 931.12 of the Oxford Codified Ordinance, chapter 931.12, entitled Garbage, Refuse, and Recycling Service. Okay, thank you very much. This is first reading. Welcome, Michael. Good evening, Your Honor, members of council. Take us through this. So this is really a housekeeping item. Uh, years ago, if you were going to build a house 
and you ask for construction water while the house is being built, uh, we would put a jumper or a blank piece of pipe where your meter would go and you could have access to water. Uh, since that time, we, we don't want to have unmetered water or unaccounted for water. So we stopped that practice and uh, we insist that you have a construction meter and all the water that is used uh, goes through the meter. So that's great for the water utility. But in meeting with the finance director, uh, based on our rules, uh, she is still required to collect uh, trash and recycling fees for that account. So we're simply asking for the authority for construction water accounts to uh, give us the authority to waive that fee. Okay. Uh, Rump, you will not accept construction debris uh, so the builders obviously have to have construction dumpsters on their site. So it's an added expense that they shouldn't have to pay. So we're asking for approval to resolve that. Okay. So be glad to answer any questions. Very clear, I think. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Counselors have any comments or questions? Seems quite reasonable to me. Thank you. So we will have it on our next agenda for a vote. And you can read the second one. An ordinance approving a conditional use permit application to allow a dog training facility as a conditional use for the purpose of allowing training tracks canine learning center to operate in the existing building located at 5500 College Corner Pike, Oxford, Ohio, 45056 with conditions. Okay, and Sam? Good evening, Mayor Welcome. Councilman. Take us through it. Thank you. Uh, we have a request uh, that's been reviewed by the Planning Commission from architect Scott Webb on behalf of Jeff Silverman, who's planning to relocate his business from College Corner to Oxford. This is at the site uh, that is near Walmart. Uh, it's been called the planning forum or a daycare in the past, so you might be familiar with the location, 5500 College Corner Pike. Um, the closest code that we could find uh, would be a kennel um, that would require a conditional use process. However, this is not being uh, used as a kennel, uh, there would be a dog training facility. So we took it through the process through Planning Commission to the, the purpose of the conditional use is just to consider if there's any potential uh, nuisance impacts to surrounding properties. Uh, so it was found to be acceptable by the Planning Commission and there are some conditions uh, that have been added and have been agreed to uh, by the applicant. Uh, so it went pretty smooth at the Planning Commission. Uh, so happy to answer any questions. Um, so it's an indoor primarily uh, usage for the for the facility of the existing business relocating to Oxford. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, ben, I have a question for you. As someone who very successfully trained their dog through this organization in College Corner, am I required to recuse myself from oh. this vote? I was a customer a really happy customer. <laughs> um, you would not be required. To, okay, thank as you. As long as you don't have any ongoing business no, I interest don't. or pecuniary interest individually. I, I don't. Yes. But that was the best dog ever. <laughs> and I credit training tracks 100% and I recommend them to everybody. Okay, um, is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Scott, come on up. Mr. Mayor, members of council, um, Scott Webb, I don't know if you can put it in the record there. Um, don't really have anything to add. Uh, Planning Commission was very helpful, as was staff, through this process in trying to find a, a good way to adaptively reuse this. It really seems ideal, both in terms of location and facility, so we're really uh, happy and uh, we're willing to meet the conditions and hope for your support. Super. Meeting. Seems like a good location. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Steve, come on up. Right. Steve Schnabel, yes. <laughs> yes, I am Steve Schnabel still, 44 Autumn Drive. Just wondering, since there's a great deal of property there, is it possible that the business would be able to use some of that land as a dog park? Well, that Just would be thinking. up to them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, thank you. And um, counselors have any questions or comments? I just love the fact we've, you know, 
found a found a home for this building and College Corners Loss is is our game. I, I'm happy to have them come to Oxford. I am too. And use this site. Great. Well, and I think this was one of these cases where um, the fact that it went through the conditional use process, I think that, like, I, I've not been a customer, but all the respect that I hear for the business made this one of these things that people were inclined to be supportive of. But once you grant a conditional use, then if another business owner could come in. And, and so there were just some conditions just to ensure that, for example, there was no outdoor kenneling of dogs and all these things that would just kind of ensure that no matter who the owner is, that we can trust it. Um, I also would like to credit uh, uh, Mr. Perry and the Planning Commission because staff had there were some initial recommendations in terms of traditionally, you know, there's a requirement that the, the, that lots be consolidated, at, you know, as part of development. And I think in appreciation for the economic development potential, that there was flexibility on the part of community development and and the Planning Commission to back off some of the commission, the, the conditions that we didn't feel were like really absolutely necessary and, and that may not be a big deal, but to a small business owner might be, I mean, to have to go through the conditional use process is, is a cost that someone's having to make and so to, to remove those unnecessary costs. So I think the Planning Commission was really happy and these are kind of the minimum conditions required to just ensure that this would be good for all the neighbors, no matter who owns it. Okay, anyone else? Thank you very much. Again, this will be on our agenda for the next meeting. You may read the next one. An ordinance approving a preliminary and final plan development application and preliminary subdivision South Farm Section 4, 25 new single family lots submitted by JA Development, 6.81 acres, Roberts Drive, Oxford, Ohio, 45056. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. This may sound familiar because it is. The, the South Farm development has been in front of City Council several times over the past two or three years. Uh, on behalf of uh, this time, it's on behalf of Christo Homes, uh, Joe Christo. We've worked closely with them uh, to uh, potentially take over the development that was previously approved on behalf of another property owner who's still the owner. Uh, and so this is a planned development that's actually our recommendation to Planning Commission was to do a combined review of preliminary and final since it had been through the process before. It's relatively the same basic layout, same number of homes. Uh, it's a little under seven acres, uh, it's 25 homes. They are setting aside almost two acres of conservation easement land, planting 46 new trees. Uh, there are some changes with the street width uh, and the setbacks and spacing between the buildings. Uh, so those would be noticeable changes, but the overall density is the same. Um, Mr. Mike Rudolph does uh, live in the adjacent neighborhood and has kind of served as a mouthpiece for both uh, the developer and the neighbors to help to communicate some of the concerns back and forth. Um, and there really wasn't any new comments uh, through the Planning Commission process, the most recent review. So the recommendation that we're passing along, although it is very detailed, you can see we definitely got into a lot of details. Uh, it, there was agreements uh, from the applicant to meet those conditions. We did make one slight change uh, to um, the width of the garage um, by adding a numerical uh, maximum to kind of uh, keep a certain type of street presence in the neighborhood that is not so vehicular dominant while still allowing access for really one car garages, which is a suggestion that we made to the developer uh, that they were okay with. Uh, the other change is removing um, one side of the development and the previous uh, design was to have a rear access alley. Um, and their, re their request from Crystal Homes was to not have that so that there would be consistent uh, product um, options. Uh, so it would be the same on both sides of the street. However, that did present uh, a little bit of a um, creative challenge for uh, service vehicles to get in, a, in and out because that was providing the, um, the vehicle kind of through a drive uh, to use that alley on the one side. So they were open to uh, providing a turnaround on actually an adjacent property through an easement that we obtained several years ago from Talawanda Schools. Uh, so that would actually be constructing a, a stub street for the future Booth Road uh, that would serve as a turnaround uh, that's actually off-site of the development, but it would be a new public right-of-way improvement. Uh, so there's been a lot of small changes which we think would hopefully uh, meet the expectations of the developer to move forward with the project and also the minimum uh, expectations of the neighborhood as well. 
Okay, and the uh, the side yard setbacks, did that change? Feet. It did. Uh, they've been reduced from five feet to three feet. So the total distance between the homes uh, would be six feet. Uh, so that's, wow. that's quite narrow. Um, and we did some research on that with um, the with another uh, neighborhood in actually in Indiana uh, and in their in discussions with them um, their some of the research showed that by putting all the mechanical uh, attachments um, on the two sides that are closest to each other that would allow the the other sides to have more freedom of movement for emergency access so it's it's still very tight, um, but um, there are homes that have no spacing whatsoever, so it, it can be done, but those are typically where there's a rear access of some kind. Um, so the street is also narrower, um, and in discussions with city manager Elliot, uh, the, um, having parking restricted to only on one side would still allow enough access for freedom of movement for service vehicles, emergency vehicles. Uh, so there's, there's definitely um, been some compromises made, um, but in order to have a, a variety of housing stock in the community, um, that's what has to be done at some point. Um, and so that's, that's where we're at with this. Um, it would meet the building code uh, for spacing between the buildings because anytime you have less than five feet from a property line, uh, there's a fire rating requirement that is above and beyond uh, the typical requirements. So there probably would not be any uh, windows on the sides, which is actually not that uncommon for uh, new single family home subdivisions anyway, uh, but it would be mandated that there would be a fire rating because of the close proximity. Um, so um, okay. they, it's compliant, it's just different than what we've seen. It is. So a new thing. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this one? Welcome. Good evening, Etta Reed with Bear Becker on behalf of John Bear. And with me tonight is Joe Christo of Christo Homes. Should you have any questions for him? Um, as Sam has indicated, um, we are in agreement with all the conditions that are proposed. Um, we do truly appreciate Planning Commission and staffs working with us to bring this project to fruition. Uh, I know the Christos have made some, you know, some, they've made some, some adjustments to their normal program to make this work on their end. Um, you know, we will have the anti-monotony standard, which is one of the conditions in there, so that all the homes won't look the same. They have the porches sitting up forward and the garage is sitting back, so just to give a better street presence. So we're both here if you have any questions, um, and thanks again for your assistance. Thank you, Etta. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else who would like to address this ordinance? Councilors? Do you want to say anything from planning? What issues came up that you want to cover? Uh, my concern is uh, I don't mind the aesthetics or any of those issues. I don't think that's mostly our domain, but safety. So I always look at Fire Chief and his recommendations. And I think we have a compromise that meets that. <laughs> uh, he should so the road is still night. wide enough <clears throat> to allow a fire truck to go down even if cars are parked along the side. In terms of access, and then also the closeness of the houses, because mm -hmm. there's fire in one, it could spread right. to others. Um, that was my chief concern. There were issues about the garages as well, and things like that that we talked about in planning. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is um, this is what's really great is this is approximating what our comprehensive plan says we should be developing, which is kind of traditional urban neighborhoods, that a little more compact, a little denser. Uh, that building's a little bit closer to the street than we've been doing in recent decades. And, but you know, our code not it hasn't always supported that. You know, we still kind of have a somewhat suburban code that doesn't necessarily align with our comprehensive plan. In a couple years, we're probably gonna have code that will support a lot of the details of this by right. But I think in working back and forth with the developer, it was able to strike a really nice balance um, here. And, you know, and my hope is, I mean, we've seen this come through a number of times, and at this point, I want the development to work. I want it to work for the developer. I want them to be able to sell houses. And so I'm, I'm trusting that, I know that this meets our standards. I hope it meets the developer's standards, because I do think, like the habitat development, this will not be afford low to moderate income housing 
but this is going to be a little closer to affordable, affordable or at least entry level kind of market rate housing. These are going to be relatively compact units. They don't have really large lots. And I think this is going to be really an attractive development that people are going to want to live in. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate staff's trying to in include staff, meaning the engineering, service and engineering, fire, to, to work on the basic thing of like making sure so making sure that the air conditioning or the heat pumps are not, you know, that they're alternated so there's clear fire access. I just think this is really a finely tuned kind of development. I hope it goes and so. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Other counselors have questions or comments? I, I'd just like to comment that the first time I saw anything about Christo Homes was when we were reviewing applications for the Chestnut Street property. Um, and I remember thinking that the, the application was, was very well done, it seemed like really good quality homes, but it just didn't quite meet the price point that we were looking for, for the low to moderate um, cost housing for the Chestnut Street development. So uh, I think we have a win-win in the room today because we have Habitat for Humanity and now another developer, Christo Homes, has been able to uh, work something out for some other land in our community. So I think it's great. I will also just comment that as a Midwesterner used to big lots, that's just how I grew up in a small town, that when I moved to California, I had to readjust my thinking. <laughs> Toronto, too. And I realized it was OK to be close. We had five, five foot side yard setbacks and that it, it was quite fine. It was just a sidewalk along the side is about all there was room for. And it, we, we grew to quite like it and I grew to like not having to mow it. So <laughs> I thought it was a win-win. All right, oh, any other I, questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we want and need more density. Yes. The only concern I have around that is safety. So as long as we take care of the safety, I'm all for greater density. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, for the number one uh, recommended conditions, I still think that's a little ambiguous. Could we like, does anybody else find that ambiguous with the page. width of the garage? You want to give uh, us a page? Uh, it's past 140. It's 141, number one. Okay, thank you. It's actually, if you go to this, if you look at 144, um, it has the reworded. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we, what we did is took the planning commission wording and didn't change it and then the second half of the ordinance we put the revised one great so um, take a look at that on the top of page 145 um, where it says um, maximum door width of 14 feet and then tandem two guard garages are permitted I think the concern of the developer was we, st we still want the option of having the capacity for two cars but they would be in tandem instead of beside each other yeah, it's still weird that we call it a one-car garage and then a two-car garage kind of simultaneously. <laughs> sure, even on the revised I had a tandem garage. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I know what it need. means, but in the wording, yeah. it's yeah. you have to have only a one-car garage, but also a two-car garage. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Is that just me? <laughs> well, we're so, saying that no home shall have an overall garage which of two cars yeah. greater, so, so it has to be less. Yeah. yeah. As, as long as that's clear to us, which sure. I guess we're defining now, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. Thanks. Words matter. They do. All right. Are we good? We'll move on to the next one. You can read it. An ordinance revising Oxford Zoning Code Section 114101. Accessory regulations for the purpose of adding primary residence requirement for short-term rental usage within the R1A, RB1, R2A, and R3 zoning districts. Okay, and Sam, you can take us through this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, you may recall the discussion of the moratorium on a new short-term rentals back in March. Uh, and so during that time period, we have done some research off and on and had a couple planning commission discussions about uh, what to do with tightening up the regulations. I know there were a couple council members who were concerned about the potential of conversions from primary residence owner occupied single families to uh, more of the, the kind of the business sector. Uh, and so we did some research on that. And actually, I was kind of skeptical about this uh, at the beginning. Uh, but we, we did see that there have been some conversions that did take those offline from being able to be uh, purchased by anyone, really, whether it's market rate or above market rate. Um, and so the moratorium put a hold on that while uh, we looked at how to potentially um, tr 
try to minimize the number of conversions, even though it's still a fairly small market in Oxford. Um, and we're not a resort community, but we do have housing that is geared towards short-term rental usage. Uh, so um, you may remember we purchased some additional software, uh, which gave us a little bit uh, broader perspective on what was happening in the market. Um, and I provided some data on that. Um, we were hoping to find some correlation between uh, purchase prices and um, the usage of short-term rental. We weren't able to really find a strong correlation other than the anecdotal data of knowing individual properties that had been converted. Um, so there just hasn't been enough market uh, transactions in the past couple years um, to really show a strong correlation. But um, we did some research on, and actually we had this prepared several months ago, uh, the city of Louisville had a primary residence requirement, and we basically copied that language. Uh, and we feel like it's uh, broad enough that, um, and most people are willing to comply as long as we tell them that's what the requirement is uh, for the zoning districts that are outside kind of the mile square area, which Heather read. Um, and so the ones that are inside the mile square would not have that limitation on them because the majority of those homes are already in the rental market. Um, there could be some, some tweaks to that, but that's kind of the general overview that the Planning Commission recommended. Uh, and so the, the attached ordinance that we have it's not actually an ordinance form, but it has the strikeout and underline, um, has that primary residence requirement. Uh, we think that will uh, minimize uh, potential for conversions. However, anyone that already has uh, a registered rental, which we would define as an, an approved rental permit, and they have also um, filed their lodging tax account and have been actively remitting uh, to the finance department through the software that we have, we would consider those to be continued to be allowed uh, or grandfathered or legal non-conforming. But any new ones would have to meet the requirement for primary residence in these zoning districts. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Okay. Counselors have any questions or comments? Well, I want to express my gratitude. I mean, as someone who's been along on this ride for a while, um, and you know, you're all, I think many of you have been along for this ride. I mean, it was a number of years ago where this was just an entirely new thing. We were trying to wrap our head around it. And initially we were worried about the quality of life things. Like what happens to all the people coming and going? And that's how we ended up with limits and that kind of stuff. But I think even that time in 2019, we started to recognize this had the, this had the potential to displace the primary residence use. And, and, and at the time I thought that was okay because we were permitting these short-term rentals as an accessory use to a primary use. Um, but what ended up happening is we were seeing these units being permitted, and in my own neighborhood, I could see houses that people used to live in becoming Airbnbs only, vacant most of the time, and then, then with Airbnbs. And at one level, you could say it's not a problem. You know, what's the, they're pretty quiet, they're pretty well maintained. So it wasn't a quality of life problem, but it was just a, A, it was a neighborhood problem, like, where we used to have a neighbor, I ended up having a vacant house with guests. And, but also, um, you know, I think there was the question about the affordability. And I used the one anecdotal example that I know it's, you know, but on, on Ridge, there was a property that uh, a neighbor lived in and he passed away. It was purchased and then repurchased and someone was using it as a, as a B and B and, and, and advertising it for sale based on the, the rental income, $42,000 a year. They set the sale price on a house that I think Bo had bought at $56,000 at $410,000. Um, that was probably too high of a price, but the point was, and this is a very powerful anecdote, is that when Sam, I know Sam made sure to communicate to this person who was advertising, hey, no, there's a moratorium, you don't have a license, you can't do this, it dropped that price from 410 to 370 to ultimately the house sold at 270 to a family who's living in it. And so the mere fact of the moratorium mm -hmm. kept a house in owner occupancy, you know? And so I think this ordinance will do the same thing. Um, and I think that the, the I, I personally, I'm super happy with the primary residence thing because this hits a, on a couple of different things. One, it means that, again, you can still do the weekends you can still rent it out in the summertime. You can rent out your whole house. You can rent out a part of your house, but it has to be your house and not just an investment property. And I think that also is going to rein in a little bit the, the justification of people who are like, I'm going to buy a house for my kids, and then when they graduate, I'm just going to rent it out as an Airbnb. Like, it's, it's got to be somebody's house. So I think what we've sliced and diced is 
it doesn't take away that, that income that does support some people. Some people are renting out houses and they're supporting themselves with it. And, that's, and that can help that's offset our there. affordability problems in Oxford. Mm -hmm. But like other cities, what we've done is we've closed the door on the displacement and the hypergentrification. Some of the animals are out of the barn already, you know, those people that have it, and that's a little too bad. But I think late is better than never. And I thank Sam for coming around and looking at what other cities have done. And I think this really like hits this right on the, the, the hits the nail on the head. And I have a question. Uh, on the grandfathering, if somebody sells their property later, does the new owner have to go by the new regulations? Yeah. They, it's they have grandfathered year. forever. As long as they uh, reapply within one year, they're allowed to continue it. But if they don't, then it goes away. Okay, yeah. thank you, mm -hmm. appreciate it. You know, this is another way that supports our goal of having housing for everybody because if these all get bought up and pretty soon neighborhoods are full of corporate owned or family owned but just there vacant until there's an Airbnb design, it changes the whole character of our community. Yeah. And I think what we're doing here saves the character of our community. And I would say as, as cost effectiveness goes, we had to we had to develop an ordinance it cost staff time but if you see the amount of dollars we have to invest in order to incentivize the construction of new affordable housing to use an ordinance that preserves existing affordable housing is pretty cost effective per unit so it is all right thank you i have a couple yes. questions mm -hmm. how many short term rentals have been applied for licensing do you have a rough percentage we, there's quite a few, I think it's around 40, uh, that we do not have any license. We don't know where they are. Uh, we know they exist, uh, but we just have listing information and advertising listing, but we don't have addresses or locations because the software that we used gives a general neighborhood location, but. Is that 40 out of how many to, in total? Uh, we have, um, so to page 212 um, has some statistics there. Um, we have 69 active short-term rentals in the community. Uh, so um, that 40 number may have been inactive. It may have been active, but we have a, um, we don't know where some of those are. So, But if um, they're not registered, then they're not grandfathered. Right, yeah. By the time this passes. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, moratorium is in yeah. effect yeah. until next yeah. month. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, you could let it expire after the six months, and this ordinance will be in effect next month as well. So it'd be around the same time. Well, wait a minute, Sam. Our ordinance is effective 30 days after the second reading. So this is August, and then in the uh, moratorium uh, goes out in September. So it would be the End of September? Uh, I think it's September 5th. So, so do we need to re-up the... We may have to, we may have to extend, extend to it another about. month. Yeah, yeah, we may have to do that. I was okay. planning on doing that on the next agenda. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then how many short-term rentals are in the mile square? I don't think I have that statistic in here. Let's see. Actually, yeah. Um, so we have some statistics for the ones that are uh, very active. So if you look at the bottom of page 212, of the 34 that are rented over 90 days per year, um, which that's a pretty big number comparing to 69, so that, those are businesses. Um, 20 are outside the mile square and four are unknown. So I don't know what the total number in the mile square is, I just know the ones that are active, that are very active over, over 90 days. Which are not, so it's not that many that are currently in the mile square, right? That's correct. Well, there's there's quite a few we don't have locations on. Okay. So, but it looks like four only four unknown. Right. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Because I I mean the intention the ultimate intention just like everyone said is to just preserve housing supply, and I just feel like the mile square has been, it's such a challenging place, right? Like, it's it's great, right? Having that mixture of student rentals with permanent residents. Um, <laughs> I just worry a little bit about what other havoc we could be unleashing on the mile square when it's already struggling for permanent residents of allowing short-term rentals to focus 
on the mile square. I, I would argue that it might be a bad thing to not include the mile square, especially being a resident there. There was, a, I would just say that there was concern on the planning mm -hmm. commission about this too. I think we couldn't wrap our heads. I mean, Sam had an idea about like, cause a lot of those properties already have rental permits. We're effectively part of this program. Mm -hmm. But so I think there was concern and the planning commission was like, we kind of felt like we wanted to move forward with this, but, but I didn't, I don't, there was a, I feel like there was a consensus that we didn't want to throw the mile square to the wolves on this one but we didn't have a solution for what that would look like. So the, the market is not, we're not really seeing that many new ones being added. I mean, five years, I think it's been seven years ago we did a study and there were over 100. So, and then when COVID came, the, the market really dropped out. It's picked up a little bit, but you could always tweak this later. And so I think the amount of um, analysis it would take to figure out where in the mile square we want to have this restriction while still allowing the ones that are I guess what I'm saying is if we did not exclude the mile square we would be creating a lot of nonconformities because there's so many that are already in existing that because they have a rental permit does it but, but the short-term rental is kind of looped in under that yeah. rental per okay. it was under the previous program but now we're going to actually have two permit applications so that we know when a new one is being applied for, they'll actually be applying for one or, or both at the same time. Okay. So it will be more clear. Okay, so going forward, that would be right. something easier to rectify. Correct. So, okay. But how do we then make sure, that if we're gonna have two separate permit pathways, how do we make sure that we, for example, keep a lid on the new short-term rental permits in the mile square? We can't do anything about all the grandfathered well, rental that would permits. Be through, that would be through monitoring software, and there's, lots of companies we we have two of them right now that are constantly trying to sell us their services to monitor compliance but I'm, in terms of the code does i mean currently the code is not going to prohibit new short-term rental permits in the mile square Only the way it's written no it would not so what would it take code wise to include areas in the i mean there some cities have basically said this is an area short-term rentals have at it you know it's a hotel district or something but if we had qualms about portions of the mile square where we didn't want to have short-term rentals, how much code revision would it take? We could give that some thought. I think we would need to take it back through the Planning Commission, contact the property management companies, let them know what we're thinking. Um, you know, I don't think it's something that we should do between the first and second reading. But I'm, I'm open to, you know, do, if you want to do that, I think extending the moratorium three more months is probably going to be a minimum. I have a question, Sam. Is there any sort of information, right? Like we're about to get two new pretty large hotels mm -hmm. in town. Are there other municipalities where you can look at rates of short-term rental growth compared to the opening of new hotels? Because I get, my hunch is that it would stagnate, but There's I don't. not really much collaboration between the two market types. Okay. Most of them are very siloed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a totally new research project for us to try mm -hmm. to compare the two. Gotcha. Although I will say there's 380 hotel rooms right now. So adding another 180 is going to change the market quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Now there are some people that do prefer Airbnb. So that's not going to affect them. But for many people, they just want a place in Oxford or close to Oxford. So we'll probably see some drop out of the market. Yep. With, yeah, again, just making sure that we want families in the homes. So families in the homes, student rentals, the last case scenario would be a short-term rental that's permanent. So I think this is so great, and thank you so much for working on this and listening and, like, adapting to it. Thanks for the questions. Great questions. But I, I, I think if we follow this line of, I think that if we're going to need to extend the moratorium anyway, we might we're going to give ourselves a little bit of time to at least answer the question about the mile square specifically. Because it may not be all the mile square, but there are portions of the mile square for which I don't think they need that extra pressure. And if we can, so. I mean, there, there's just so many homes. I look at the ones that are available for sell, and then if someone were to flip that and have as a short-term rental, that's not going to be helpful for the housing market, the housing supply, because those could be homes that a family could buy for the first time. So it's it's something that I think I don't want to look back in 15 years and say, dang, we didn't realize that would happen. Yeah, I'm with you. Jason. The other Jason. 
I was going to let Sam respond, if that's okay. No, I'd like you to speak. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to say that's particularly important, especially if we have a drop in attendance at Miami and houses start opening up. But I was going to say, in terms of the grandfathering in with the one-year transfer, is that by default? Is that by right? Is there anything that precludes that from being altered legislatively? Uh, it's, it's pretty typical land use law um, nationwide to if you have a use that has been documented as approved, uh, then that use is allowed to continue. Um, I don't think it's impossible to change that because th this is still relatively new territory in the land use regulation world. Uh, so I don't know if this is any, being any case tested on it. I'm not sure Oxford wants to be the place to test it. Uh, but, you know, I think it's, um, we did consult with the law director of, about that. Uh, and I think, generally speaking, um, it follows the same logic of most land use law. Although, I will say that um, this use is so temporal that telling someone that they can, they're allowed to do that continually when you really don't see any, there's no exterior visibility of it. It's a very temporal use. So um, there's probably an argument that it doesn't, the same logic doesn't apply, but that hasn't been tested to my knowledge. Yeah. Well, if it wasn't precluded, that might be something we might consider, too, because it seems to me it would make sense to disappear with the transfer of ownership. But. Okay. We will take it up again at our next meeting. You can read the next one, please. An ordinance repealing and replacing ordinance number 3758, limiting the number of non-medical cannabis dispensary license in, to two in the city of Oxford and designating the locations for these two non-medical cannabis dispensaries at the current existing locations for the two medical cannabis dispensaries. Okay, and Doug? Yeah, so the city of Oxford has two uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, and as you know, uh, they receive their dual-use dispensary license and certificate of operation and both began selling recreational marijuana today. So this particular ordinance deals with one of those two businesses, RJK Holdings of Ohio, LLC, operating as Pure Iconic, located at 5280 College Corner Pike, plans to relocate to 5640 College Corner Pike since the company owns the building. Uh, the furniture Fair location is what we're talking about former furniture fair. So ordinance number 3758 was adopted by council on January 16, 2024, and it designated locations for two non-medical recreational cannabis dispensaries at the current existing medical marijuana locations. So this ordinance then will repeal and replace uh, that ordinance uh, dealing with uh, the non-medical cannabis dispensaries. This replacement ordinance will permit the relocation of Pure Iconic from 5280 to 5640 College Corner Pike, and the re this replacement ordinance will not change the number of allowed non-medical marijuana dispensaries in the city of Oxford, which will remain at two. Okay. Is there anyone from the public who'd like to address this ordinance? Okay, I have a question. Yes. So this ordinance assumes that they will make that move. What if they decide not to make that move or if they are not approved to make it's, that move? It's written such that they can stay at their current location. Okay. Uh, you know, they can't move and keep the other location and then we have three. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, if they move, that's fine. If they don't move, they can stay where they're at. Okay. And, you know, I Just shared wanted with- to make that clear yeah. for the public. Yeah. Any other questions? Is there any other questions? Okay. We'll move then to the next ordinance. An ordinance by Oxford City Council authorizing the city manager to take all action necessary, including but not limited to the negotiation and execution of purchase and sale agreement for the sale of certain real property located in the city of Oxford, Ohio to Habitat for Humanity of Greater Cincinnati. Okay. Doug or Jessica? Jessica. Jessica. Good evening again. This is our last piece of legislation um, regarding Habitat for Humanity of Greater Cincinnati. Um, over the last several months, we've been working with Habitat on a proposed ground lease, which is our original proposed model for this development. Um, but after several meetings, it became apparent that a ground lease model would be very challenging for Habitat for Humanity. 
it would limit their ability to secure funding for the project. Some of these include HUD home funds, Habitat Ohio ARPA allocation, and the Federal Home Loan Bank. In addition, some of their private funding through individuals, corporations, and private foundations include similar land ownership requirements. Logistically, it turned out that a ground lease would be challenging for the city as well, because we're allowing home ownership every time a home sold, we would have to enter into a new ground lease every single time with that individual. So uh, over time, you can imagine what that would look like. And then it was pointed out to us that the city of Oxford would also have to be a member of the HOI in or HOA in perpetuity as the landowner. So with this information and wanting to help them, um, especially with their funding, um, and with the strong reputation of Habitat for Humanity, their trusted model, and their model of home ownership, we um, would recommend this purchase agreement. Okay. I'm happy to answer any questions or have a tech in Do you want to talk about the, the basics of the sale agreement, of what it involves? So as we far would. As resale and. We would sell it for a dollar. Um, and then there are conditions that, you know, if they don't uphold their proposed program or their proposed model that they have. Um, a, a, they have proposed to do. Um, there's also time restrictions. We do have, um, you know, reverting language that we would then be able to get that land back. Right. So they can't just sell it to no, somebody no, 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 else. No. It That's what I this. wanted to yes. clarify. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Okay. Thank you, counselors. We're learning so much as we go. We are. We, you know how, how to do this right, and we we have our good intentions, and then sometimes we figure out what actually is the right mechanics. And I think and I, I think this will work, yeah. and and we are protected. The reason I wanted Jessica to say that is that it protects the city in the case of something catastrophic happening and uh, uh, habitat changing their mind. The city has not lost anything in that process. I mean, it's sad that we would lose the project, but we don't lose the property, and the property comes back to us. And we don't want an for a dollar. And we don't want an HOA telling us how to garden and put up flags. No, and that. we don't want all that. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? All right. We can actually move to second readings. An ordinance amending ordinance number 3750, supplemental budget ordinance number four, to make supplemental appropriations for fiscal year 2024. Okay, is there a motion to adopt the so, ordinance? So moved. Second. There's been moved and seconded. Heidi, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. There are a few changes to the second reading of the ordinance, the first being an additional $5,639 to the revenue and expense in the general fund to account for the reimbursement uh, from Enjoy Oxford for the Eclipse event. This will allow for additional creative placemaking projects um, that was taken out of the budget uh, to, to help pay for Enjoy Oxford's portion. Um, the second change is the addition of $3,693.91 to the revenue and expense for the purchase of two new AED units at the Parks and Recreation Department with funds granted by Oxford Community Foundation. And the third change is an additional $20,000 in revenue and appropriation to account for a donation through the Oxford Community Foundation to pay for a canopy at a playground. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public who would like to address this ordinance? Councilors have any additional questions or concerns? You may call the roll. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Ms. French? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Ms. Ragu? Yes. Mr. Prethurge? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mayor Snavely? Yes. The ordinance is adopted. And we will move now to a discussion of property maintenance code enforcement. And I'd like to recognize the city manager. Okay. So this item on the agenda came at the request of uh, Councillor Prethridge. Uh, David requested a report and discussion about code enforcement, especially concerning the property at 101 West Church Street. Uh, this property is owned by Terry and Kathy Dudley. I had invited them tonight, and as you can see, they decided to join us. So welcome, Terry and Kathy. Uh, so uh, basically, what we have here is this property was a student rental until an attic fire in January of 2020. The structure was not repaired. Later in 2020, the HAPC approved a certificate of appropriateness for demolition of the existing structure and new mixed-use structure. It was not constructed. 
the owner requested an extension of the HAPC approval to obtain a building permit beyond the one-year deadline, and it was denied by the HAPC. So I sent council a summary of code enforcement issues and actions related to this property beginning in 2004. And so I've asked Sam then uh, to provide some additional information about code enforcement in general and some of the challenges the city faces in obtaining compliance. And so Sam, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna just read a little bit of a summary. It's only front and back, not too long. <laughs> um, might be a little bit over five minutes though. Um, so the property 101 West Church is sometimes known as the former funeral home. Many know it as that. Uh, as Mr. Elliott noted, there was a recent case approved by a city board to demolish the existing building and replace it with the new building. Um, as he said, this is called a certificate of appropriateness. The Historic and Architectural Preservation Commission held three meetings to review the request in 2020. Mr. Dudley and his architect prepared a very detailed rationale for demolition and new construction that was found to meet the city's requirements and was approved by a majority of the HAPC. This was the first major demolition request following the 2019 changes to the demolition criteria requirements. The 2019 code changes also added an additional one year for construction of a new building in the historic district for a total of three years. One year to obtain the permit after HAPC approval and two years to build. Previously, it was one year and one year. Uh, so backing up a little bit, as you can see from the brief summary, uh, there has been code enforcement activity in city records both before and after the HAPC case. Issues regarding parking expansion, vegetation management, building maintenance. City staff typically have very high compliance rates across the city with code enforcement. We're happy to report that. When city staff requests corrective action, this one in particular, however, where, is where compliance rates have been historically low. I can attest that city staff have not pursued additional measures of gaining compliance for 101 West Church Street beyond standard methods of voluntary compliance requests, reminders, notifications. In 2021, some of you on city council may recall that we began the process of moving property maintenance code enforcement from a contracted task to a direct report city staff function in my department. This was done as part of an overall effort to gain higher rates of code compliance for primarily life safety items, such as biennial inspections of residential rental properties. Our first year of bringing this task in-house saw compliance rates around 50 to 60% of the inspections, which required follow-up inspections to get that compliance, get that rental inspection approved and issued we're now running around 80 to 90 percent of our life safety inspections on the very first inspection with very few follow-ups. So we're happy to report that and proud of that. We've had several property managers in the first year not consent to those inspections of the rental properties, which sometimes required administrative search warrants, which is a very time-consuming process. We're now down to only two remaining property managers that are not consenting to full interior inspections. So I'm just painting you a little bit of a picture of kind of what our staff have been up to in the code enforcement world. During this same time frame, our staff, Becky, Annie, Derek, and Zach have worked very hard to provide as much transparency as possible uh, about the status of the rental properties as far as if they've been uh, inspected, permits issued, when that has happened, um, so we do that through monthly reports on our website, and we have GIS maps as well, all available 24-7 on the city website. Um, moving forward, in 2023, uh, in response to public feedback and the successful grant application uh, from Assistant City Manager Jessica Green, we were able to obtain funding from Interact for Health for additional staffing. We did hire one person. That person I wasn't able to continue. We've hired another person and we're doing training with them now uh, part-time to assist with inspections and code enforcement. Uh, and that funding is through uh, tobacco mitigation, uh, health for youth, um, and for the tobacco retailer licensing program, which you recall as well. Uh, and we're also allowed to use that funding for code enforcement. This gives us greater redundancy, having that staffing to allow us to spend more time proactively seeking out code violations that are not directly related to life safety. So kind of expanding that 
beyond the life safety function. The civil citation process is our preferred process when we do not have voluntary compliance for code enforcement items. We have not done that yet on 101 West Church Street, but we are prepared to do that if compliance is not gained. The civil citation provides a financial incentive to make corrective action. Earlier in 2024, uh, we signed a new contract with a collections agency, uh, Rossman Collections. You may recall seeing that in a, in a department report so that we can turn over unpaid civil citations to uh, this company for code enforcement violations. This is a new step for us, uh, and if successful, we, uh, we think will be much more affordable than criminal prosecution because it's a civil process. Both civil and criminal methods are available uh, for code enforcement, available to the city, uh, and the criminal prosecution would be through our law director. Um, more recently, on July 18th, we issued a new code enforcement violation notice to Mr. and Mrs. Dudley uh, for 101 West Church Street regarding three items, uh, windows and peeling paint repair, deteriorated wood trim, and damaged shutters. Uh, an appeal of the order is an option for the owner or compliance by August 18th. If no appeal is submitted and compliance is not determined by the city, then a second and final notice is given with a new date. And if that final notice is not complied with, then civil citations can be issued at that point. Uh, and then those can be appealed or paid. Uh, and so that's the three-step process that's in, in the, our uh, ordinances. It's in Chapter 503. It's very similar for police and fire citations as well. Uh, after looking at the property again today, I see that there's now an issue of overgrown vegetation and gravel parking expansion that was not in the July 18th letter. Uh, so those will need addressed as well in order to avoid code enforcement action. So there's my summary of that particular property. Uh, we can also talk about citywide code enforcement, but I know that was originally why this yeah. question came up. So happy to answer any questions. Of course, Mr. Dudley is here as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and just a little bit of context, um, why I asked, I mean, I, 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 as a legislative body, we adopt code, you know, and, and we adopt code on the assumption it will be complied with. The administrative part is something as much as I'm familiar with planning. I don't, Sam is involved and Ben in, in, in the administrative and legal side of this that, you know, that I was unfamiliar with. But knowing that, for example, we've just anticipated signing a contract for almost $200,000 for a new development code, I just want to be confident that when we write good, robust code that we have the mechanisms to ensure compliance. And I have no reason to necessarily believe that's not the case, except for, you know, if you walk through the mile square, you can see that there's, you know, there are uneven compliance of, of their, their property maintenance conditions that are not always probably up to what our standards would be. And, and this property just happened to be one that, you know, I think if we live in a town, we get used to driving past things and just seeing just block them out. Well, it's know? a prominent location. But it's a prominent, we have a few prominent locations in town that if you were to arrive in town, you'd be like, what the heck is going on with that? And it, and it doesn't speak to, like, it would cause you to ask the question, what's going on with enforcement on a property like that? Because, I mean, even if you're not a, you know, you can just look at, a, at that particular property. But, you know, in addition to some of the stuff with the windows, you know, we do have a demolition, a prohibition on demolition by neglect in our historic and architecture preservation code. This, although there in the past has been a, an approval for, to demolition, you know, that has expired and, and that, you know, a property, we, we can't let people with historic properties grind them into the ground and then use them as a justification for demolishing them. Um, you know, it happens to be that we've got a lot of commercial parking areas, you know, on this site and adjacent that are also not permitted in our zoning code. People are generating money, taking money to park cars. Is it a problem? Well, the more it generates, the less likely we're gonna see that those properties redeveloped as the kind of things that we wanna see. So anyway, I just had the question, what's going on? Um, and, and are our systems working? And I also, you know, I mean, I think we've heard from Sam, some of this, I, basically the question was trying to understand with this as a case study, what are some of the impediments that may exist to us enforcing our code? You know, is it, is it the staffing available to do it? It sounds like staffing has been just able to cover the bare bones life and safety stuff, but not some of the things that might be visible to people. Um, 
I think one is the second was trying to understand the legal mechanisms. Okay, so you cite somebody and they don't want to pay the ordinance. Like, you know, do we have the legal resources to take them to court? I'm not familiar with that stuff. And, and part of it is also just an administrative. I think that enforcement of the law is, a, is an administrative decision, right? I mean, it's like how much appetite do you have to, to pick a fight here and there? And so I'm trying to understand if, again, I just, I think most law-abiding people believe that the law is there, and, it, and if, you, if, if you disobey the law, there will be consequences. And I think in our small little ecosystem, if there are things that seem like evident you know, scoffing at the law, you have to wonder what that does for compliance overall. So I, I appreciate the, the rundown on this particular property. Me, it was more just understanding like, and, and I can flip it around to be a question, like if we really wanted to be robust in our enforcement of the code, if we're gonna invest $200,000 in new code and we want to be able to stick, we, wanna be, we, don't, we don't wanna be a police state, but we wanna be a place where people who scoff at the law encounter consequences. So. So is it, you know, don't, do we have sufficient resource, and we don't need the answer today, but do we have sufficient financial or staffing resources to enforce our code? Do we have the legal mechanisms so we can effectively pursue people in court, and it doesn't, you know, like, is, does the court help us in that regard? Do we have the administrative appetite to take on people who are, you know, um, so those are kind of my questions. I don't know that I've, I've, I've had good information, but I still want to make sure that we have affirmative answers to all those questions. So, okay. So thank you. Thank you. Are other counselors have questions or comments? Well, I think I'll just say, you know, uh, as a member of the um, board of the Interfaith Center, we had the um, the pleasure of getting a notice from the city <laughs> that there were aspects of the Interfaith building that were not meeting code, and it was helpful to see what that letter looks like, how clear it is um, on what needs to be addressed. And the executive director and board members quickly got together to get some, um, you know, proposals, some bids to see what it would cost to fix. Um, because I think, as members of the community, we'd like to contribute to the beautification of the community. And sometimes things do fall in disrepair. You know, you you get used to things. Um, and you know, as a 501c3, um, really sh working hard to try and get grant money to be able to meet those um, to, to address the, um, the violations that, that we need to address. And so I think the information that's given is really clear and I think it's incumbent upon all members of our community, whether they're nonprofits or private business owners, to try and, and um, address what needs to be addressed. And I'd like to think that it could happen because it's the right thing to do, but I think it's important to think about how things can be enforced if that's not enough of an incentive. Doug, did you want to respond any more to that? Or? No, I, you know, the, the point that Sam made about the using the collection agency, we really haven't done that. And, you know, we'd like to see how effective that is. I mean, as Sam mentioned earlier, you know, for the most part, we do get code compliance. And, but, you know, it's the, it's the few places that we're not, and, and for whatever reason, you know, I mean, uh, things aren't getting done. So, I'd, I'm hopeful that this new process will help us uh, with some of the problem uh, sites that we have. You know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it, it does get back to resources and we do have a budget as we all know. And, you know, we're uh, in our legal department uh, for various reasons, we're, we're gonna be, you know, uh, probably asking for a supplemental in that budget. And, you know, uh, I know Sam would like to have that part-time person become full-time, so we might have to take a look at that. But as we all know, we have to have a balanced budget, and things are getting tight. But, uh, you know, uh, we're going to do the best we can. And I, I think this uh, utilizing the collection agency uh, will help us. Now, you know, it probably won't help us if uh, we have a, a LLC because it's a limited liability company and, you know, it can just go out of business. But, uh, you know. Uh, there are a lot of properties that are owned by uh, individual property owners as well. So let's give this a, a shot and see how we do with this. Okay. From, from what I'm, and this may not apply exactly, but from what I've been learning as far as different um, protections in other cities around the state, there are certain aspects of, um, as far as the LLC, establishing that there needs to be a local agent in charge, mm -hmm. right, that resides within the county. 
um, and then also applying the civil tickets that you're talking about um, or that we were emailing about. And so that's something that the local agent in charge or the property owner would be responsible for the civil tickets. And if not paid, there would be a lien on their property tax. Um, and then eventually going over towards foreclosure. So those are things, there are different mechanisms that can be effective that other cities within Ohio can do. But like Amber said, I mean, the hope is that people who are taking care of their property, like this doesn't apply to you, right? Because you're just doing what you need to do for your, that is in the best interest of the community. But in the situation in which it is ignored for whatever reason, um, there are other mechanisms that we could deploy um, and that I think we should evaluate for multiple reasons beyond just this one. Um, but I do feel, to answer your earlier question, I feel like I feel like Sam has been saying that he needs more help for enforcement for since I've been on council. Yeah. Um, and I do think that that could more than likely pay for itself in terms of meeting the goals for the community of protecting housing supply, making sure we have good quality homes, um, and we have a community that is beneficial for the residents that live here, that it seems like a wise investment to not be so strapped that we can't even do our job. Okay. Um, this is a general discussion about a code enforcement, but we talked about this particular property, which is why I wanted to make sure that the Dudleys were notified so they knew that people were talking about it. And I wanted to give you an opportunity if you wish to, and you don't have to, but if you'd like to say anything, you're invited to do so. I'm Terry Dudley, the owner of the property. As far as the parking, first of all, when you people wanted one West Chestnut, where you put the new intersection down there, Mr. Geisbach and I were talking. I said, you don't get the house unless I park cars on that lot right out there. He said, I don't have the authority to do that. He called Mr. Perry in. And Mr. Geisbach said, what do we have to do so he can park cars there? He said, consolidate the lots. That's why there's cars parked there. I was told I could park cars there. As far as the building, there was a fire in the building. As bad as it looks on the outside, it looks a hell of a lot worse inside. Uh, the other day, I boarded it up some more because people are breaking into it. I'm picking up drug paraphernalia. Bad things that people shouldn't be doing in that building. Why don't you give me a permit to condemn it, tear it down? We can all see it needs to be torn down. All this problem goes away. Who, who is the oversight for HAPC? Well, HAPC is the oversight for HAPC. That's all there is. So they're appointed, and there's no oversight to them. Not really. Is there not a legality here? BZA appeals go to BZA. So. Yeah, you can definitely go to BZA. Well, I wish I'd have known that because when they denied my uh, request for an extension, which I have no idea why they denied it, I'd spent $25,000 to get to that point. And they just like, man, big deal. You'll have to reapply. I picked up my hat and I said, to hell with this. You can see my disgust. I don't like that building looking like that any more than you do. Give me a permit, condemn it, and we'll tear it down. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I would think that uh, HA, uh, if HAPC has denied it, then the next step would be BCA. Is that correct? Sam? The denial, uh, the BCA's opportunity for overruling an HAPC decision is only for a denial of a certificate of appropriateness, not okay. for a denial of an extension. Okay. So I think the only remedy there, and I don't want to put Ben on the spot, is probably common pleas. Well, could he put in a new request for demolition? It's been expired for too long, so they would have to, he Start would have over. to submit a new application. But if he, he could submit a new application, yes. he could he could and then if it were denied, he could go to BZA. If the, if the new application was denied, he could, yes. Okay. Right. But I think that this is also tied up with the redevelopment proposal. I think that 
that the property falling in on itself and this being the justification for tearing it down is exactly the dynamic we don't want to get going with our historic preservation. I think I wasn't on HAPC, but I presume that <coughs> the understanding was there was a redevelopment that would add value to the site. And, and at that level, it was a, a trade off. But I think, well, I th and, you know, I wasn't part of that decision, but I think it was in the context of a redevelopment proposal, right? There's criteria for demolition, and so even though there is neglect and lack of maintenance on the exterior, the information that Dudley's uh, architect put together talked about the cost of the repair versus the, uh, the appraised cost of the building. And when it's over a certain threshold, that's one of the criteria. So even if it's determined that neglect is existing, um, there's still another criteria. Uh, so uh, he could submit that same proposal again and, and a different design and possibly get it approved again. It's up to HEPC. Um, but there is turnover on the HAPC. There is new guidelines being drafted soon. You know, so there's, there's no guarantee. But um, our hope is that in the interim stage, uh, the property owner will do the minimum, just like uh, the owner of the old bookstore has had to do for a, a vacant building. Uh, everybody's held to the same standard until there's a process that's put in place to allow something different. Okay. So. Can I ask you a question? And yeah. you don't have to answer this, but um, what do we know what started the fire, and how come insurance didn't cover it? I cannot answer that. There was wiring. They and insurance doesn't Can you cover that. The I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, the home insurance won't cover wire fires. Well, it was found that it would cost more to repair the building, as far as their guidelines, than it was worth. And I don't know the percentage of Sam. Was it 50%? It was 200% of the value. But I mean, is 50% the 50 threshold? Yes. So I, I don't understand this. We, we all know it needs tore down. Why isn't it condemned? Well, I think that it's what we're safe. talking about, I think what we're talking about is that we don't want a situation where a property owner wants to tear down a building that's historic and not getting the approval to do so just lets it deteriorate until then and they're able to I appreciate that, Mr. Yeah. Steve. But, but if there was a fire in the old part, the only part that was historical. Yeah, I understand that. The little bitty part in front is the only thing historical. Mm -hmm. well, and I, if anybody walked through that building, they'd say, this needs tore down immediately. Yeah, well, I think that, the, that your path forward on this property is clear. That's the only thing that council can help you with is to tell you the path. And the path is to go back to HAPC with a new application for demolition and replacement. Um, and if they were to turn you down for some reason, they may, may accept that. And if they don't, then you can go to BZA and ask for, uh, for them to uh, you know, take your appeal to them. So this body here does not have the authority to condemn a building and have it tore down? No. Nope. I find that hard to believe. Okay. If you question. find something in town that is a safety. We still have to follow the rules and regulations that have been established and the ordinances of the city. And I, you know, and I guess what I would like to say is I would like to see owners of historic properties comply with the code voluntarily and maintain their properties. I think that it's one of those cases where we can enter in the technicalities of this. It's. It's, it's an embarrassment to town to have people pull in and, and pass by structure in a state like that. And I think that embarrassment, unfortunately, I'm asking the question because I think it reflects on us in addition to the property owner. And so I want to have a question, how can we avoid this? How can we resolve this in the short term? But how do we avoid this in the longer term? And this just happens, you just happen to be the test case of how are things working and not working for I could us. appreciate that, but I, I felt like you were saying that I neglected this building. There was a fire and it needs to be torn down. Mm -hmm. So since the fire, I think right. the, the comments are that maybe you've neglected it since well, the would, fire. Would you, Bill, would you spend money on something I that would needs not. to come to the ground? I hey, would any not. one of you people, I'm just asking a question. Something that's going to be torn down, would you spend your hard-earned money okay. on? We're, we're not having a, yeah. an argument. I'm so having a discussion, I'm sorry. I understand. But we're not going to have a, a back and forth questioning. I appreciate your desire to do so. And I appreciate your point. Thank you. 
Did you have another comment? I'd be happy to answer any questions for the the um, nuisance or condemnation process. If anyone's interested, we can follow up with an email or report, or I can give you a little bit of an overview now. It's up to you. Well, I, th I think that you've, I mean, I, I, I know indirectly that you've been asking about nuisance ordinances, and may, it's, it may not be applicable to this property in general, but as a, as a tool in the toolkit for properties that have, I mean, if there were a drug den in a property, you know, like, do we have tools available to us like nuisance ordinances um, or not, and what would it take to get them? I don't know if that's what you, you I don't spend. want to put words in your mouth, uh, I, but I believe you've been I mean, asking there, about that kind of stuff. There are, especially depending on the cities that have a high <coughs> vacancy rate, um, they do have ordinances that specifically address that to disincentivize yeah. that. So, but from what I can tell, I don't think we have the same ordinances. No. Well, we have the historic preservation requirement. That, that's the difficulty. We're saying you got to give us a plan for a replacement building. Right. And you just can't tear it down. You know, if it was outside the historic district, it could be torn down. You know, so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, that, you know, if we're talking about a tiny little area, maybe we need to revise our HAPC requirements. Because, you know, you can't force a property owner to fix up a property, you know, that has that kind of damage, at least the historic portion. So I, I think there's where the difficulty is. I mean, you know, I've been in other cities, and, and we didn't, you know, not that they had it better, but uh, didn't have this difficulty. And, uh, uh, you know, so, you know, if we could figure out a way to just say, yeah, go ahead and tear it down, you know, and then you're yeah, going to have to. Well, this, the history yes. of this went back to Jack's Corner, and I've been around that long. Good. Where. <laughs> I mean, I don't know Jack's Corner. No, and. and he wanted to be able to tear it down and reuse it, and he had a plan, and they didn't like it, so he just tore it down. And there was nothing the city could do at the time because we didn't have a historic preservation ordinance. And it was after that that the HAPC was established to prevent exactly that from happening. So because it's a historic building in a historic district, then they, yes, can they tear it down? They can, but they have to have a plan for reuse of the property. They can't just leave it as a lot unless the HAPC would approve such a thing, which I don't think they probably would. So that's, that's basically it. Does that comport with your understanding? Yes, it does. Okay. I was just gonna talk about the, the nuisance building and the building condemnation process. There's. There's a lot of different available options. There's one in ORC for public nuisances that goes through uh, the court proceedings, and it would have to be declared uh, by a judge that it would be a public nuisance, and then there would be a process for demolition that would have to take place the owner and the owner's responsibility. And then if it doesn't happen, then the uh, local government can do that and then put a lien on the property. Um, the, the property way it sits right now, um, a code enforcement officer, someone that works for me, uh, a fire chief, or a building official could condemn a building, but it would have to meet certain criteria to do that. Uh, it would have to be a threat to the public, which I don't believe it is at this point because there's no one living in it, uh, and it is boarded up, and so um, there's, there's not a, an, an urgent threat. Uh, sometimes buildings are condemned that are close to a public right-of-way or a sidewalk, or they have what's called uh, open and unsecured uh, openings. And so that allows people to enter, like Mr. Dudley was sharing, uh, potentially uh, without permission, and that is uh, a threat to, uh, to, to the public. Uh, in its current condition, it may not um, be deemed that way. Uh, we could have a building official, fire chief, code enforcement person take a deeper look at it, um, walk through the building, see if it could potentially fall in or cave in. Um, but from what I can tell, that's not a risk at this point. But there are different processes uh, to Mr. Elliott's uh, perspective. Um, if, if it was condemned, uh, that could potentially um, circumvent the HAPC process if it reached that point. Okay, might be worth at least talking to the Dudleys and see if they would give permission for an inspection to be 
completed. I think it's a it's a slippery slope because I think the pressure on uptown, the pressure on our historic properties is enormous. We created zoning that really incentivizes the demolition of our historic structures, and it's only our code that stands between, you know, the demolition of what remains. And so I just want to make sure that uh, you know, the, the, as you know from being in town, we've lost. We've lost train stations to demolition. I fought that one too. You know, and and so we have a code that protects uptown, and I think that when the, the, the presumption is in our code that people are are maintaining their properties until such time as they're not until they're deemed no until they're deemed you know until they have certificate of de but the the demolition by neglect is a really well established pathway, um, and I just think we need to make sure how we manage it. Okay. I'm going to call this discussion <laughs> at this point and thank everybody for their participation. I would like to thank the Dudleys for coming and, and participating as well. Um, I will move then to announcements and communications and begin with City Manager Doug Elliott. Well, just one item. I, I did notify Council. The City received notification from the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency of an emergency contaminant grant award of $2.1 million. So this grant award is to provide design and engineering services for installing membrane softening to the existing water treatment plant. So I've signed the agreement July 30th, which was authorized by resolution number 7484 adopted by city council on March 21st, 2023. And I congratulate Mike Dreisbach and his staff for their success in obtaining this grant. Uh, the project is expected to be bid out before the end of the year, and the construction cost is estimated to be $18.9 And that's all I have this evening. Thank you. We anticipate the construction to begin in 2026? 2025. 2025. Yes. With completion by 2026. Yes. So it would not be unreasonable for some, this question came up earlier. It would not be unreasonable for someone who is wanting soft water at this point to rent a softener. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the hope that in a couple of years, you're not gonna have to have that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mike? Nothing tonight. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Yep. JJ? Nothing. Heidi? Uh, I just have one quick thing. Have a little bit of patience, okay? Thank you. Good luck. Chief Deathridge, anything tonight? Okay, Casey's not here. We'll go to you, Sam. Okay, Jessica? Nothing for you, Heather? Nothing tonight. Ben, okay. Nothing tonight, thanks. Nothing for me either. I have a few things, sorry. Um, <laughs> As I go to different meetings around the county, the things that I notice is that people always call out Oxford. They're like, oh yeah, we do a lot of things in Oxford. We're in Oxford, but not really anywhere else. And it makes me so proud at that health policy. You know, the fact that they were talking about us and nobody else, you know, is it kind of a testament of how uh, in touch this team is. So that's something I'd be super proud of. And then the second thing would be, as I'm calling different cities and trying to get their ordinances, the clerk of councils are amazing. Everyone else is so non-responsive, so thank you for you and your kind. Um, and the last thing would be, you know, as we talk about our housing supply, the, all these things matter, right? You're, we're making sure we're preserving affordable homes as much as possible so families and workers can stay in them and then we're building as we can, right? But as David said earlier, that is incredibly expensive and difficult to do. So preserving the homes that we have is of utmost importance. And at the same time, keeping people in their homes and preventing unnecessary evictions is equally as important. Because especially the people who are already in Section 8 HUD housing, it is almost impossible for them to find another home after they are evicted from that housing. 
So we need to make sure that the evictions that are happening are with good reason and not retaliatory. Um, as we look forward towards tenant protections, again, against the bad landlords. If you're a good landlord, this doesn't apply to you. Um, so the, I've been really fortunate to, and I've been trying so hard for the whole time I've been on council to be able to talk to people who are in these situations because they're so afraid of retaliation, right? They don't want to speak out, um, even though we know what's happening, but we need them to be able to talk to us. And it's hard from city official side that they just don't trust us, right? Like, because they're nervous that what we might do. Um, and so being able to build these inroads and talk to people that are even experiencing homelessness has been one of the greatest gifts I think I've had being on council um, and seeing the difficulties that are there, especially as we see what the Supreme Court is doing with cr allowing cities to criminalize homelessness, which I know is not something that we are in favor of here. And I know it's something that the chief has said before, you know, we're not going to criminalize someone for being homeless. Um, we know that there are areas where people are homeless are living. Um, and then as I, because of situations that have happened and seeing the way certain areas have been, uh, a lot of drug paraphernalia, uh, a lot of things that we really don't want to happen surrounding the issues of homelessness, it seems like there's been a lot of pressure placed on people to continuously move and just asking like what is our role of allowing people who have nothing to be able to exist and if they if we are constantly pushing them away or around we need to make sure that we have something that they can go to and the answer is not we're going to push you to a different county or a different part of the county that's not the answer so i go back to what i had brought up two years ago that i had witnessed in Denver this like, beautiful project of, this isn't the answer, right? This is the trying to plug up the holes in a sinking ship because we know our housing market is becoming increasingly tighter. So we need to have these emergent places where people can be. Building a shelter, I'm going to say two main points. Building a shelter, of course, we want that, right? We want a one-stop shop where people can be. That is incredibly expensive. It takes a really long time. And there's only so much space. Um, I would like to go for the most frugal, the fastest option that has been shown to be successful in other places. We need to have safe spaces where people feel that they can be. That is also something that is friendly towards neighborhoods. Because it is very challenging to tell a neighborhood, hey, we're going to put up a shelter in your neighborhood and there's a lot of people that are very concerned about what that might look like and so the project that i'm referring to in that i witnessed in denver was beautiful it was something that was up in the matter of i think it cost thirty thousand dollars it helped 24 people i believe at a time and it was heated and cooled they were ice fishing tents it was a safe space that had 24 7 social workers and security there were no drugs to be allowed on premise but there were no weapons but it was a housing first so the more this keeps getting pushed back of each year where we're going to have a cold shelter that is so expensive every single motel and hotel room that we pay for that is way more expensive than having a safe place where people can be where they feel like they can exist while we're working on this infrastructure to try to stop the homelessness problem in our town from getting worse, because it will. All the numbers show that it will, unless we do these dramatic things when it comes to housing. So I would love to revisit what other places are doing to have sp safe spaces now in a cheap way, in a way that doesn't affect a neighborhood permanently, and is something that if we follow the Denver model, it moves from vacant location to vacant location so that not one neighborhood is permanently affected by the project. Um, so yeah, I implore us to look into these options because we can't just keep pushing them around and afraid to just be out and about. Okay, thank you. Amber? Um, last week, Friday, we had a training for Living Room Conversations. The Executive Director of Living Room Conversations uh, on Zoom did a training, and I'd just like to thank everybody who came. 
There were members, uh, leadership from Oxford Police, several members of the Police Commission, Interfaith Center, Age Friendly Oxford, Oxford Seniors, Oxford Citizen for Peace and Justice, and I think it demonstrates that there are a lot of leaders in the community that see the value of having dialogue across differences and are interested in learning how to facilitate that. Um, so we're looking forward to the next steps with that. Stay tuned for that. I want to thank Mr. Dreisbach for um, a little tour he gave me today of the water treatment, water softening um, plants, and uh, just grateful to see the pride and joy in work that the um, community has in, in the water treatment. And so I want to thank him for that. And um, learn terms like a caisson and things like that. I had to go back home and, and, and research and learn what that all means, but really appreciate his efforts and congratulate him again um, on the grant. And also last week, Monday, we had a, um, a housing summit in um, Butler County, the commissioners put together, and uh, it was just great to be there and to represent Oxford, so that's it. Cheers, Nothing for me tonight. David. So just picking up on Amber's, um, it was really great meeting. I, I thought hell would freeze over before I was ever in a summit called by the Butler County Commissioners on, how, on homelessness. But I believe it was a sincere meeting. I mean, I think that I, I really credit um, Commissioner Carpenter and, and the, and the county administrator for really tackling the problem. You could see the rest of the commissioners trying to wrap their heads around that it's a problem worth addressing. But I, I, I think it revealed the a, how proud I was that the Oxford delegation was robust from the government, from the nonprofit sector, the social service sector, from community organizations. So I think it was like people do look to Oxford like, wow, you know, it's, it's not that other communities aren't doing really good things, but um, we're, uh, we're climbing the curve. Um, but also it did show that the potential of our county to, to convene us on countywide issues, which they've just really not done in the past. So, you know, having a good county commission <laughs> with good representative would be really good. I do want to thank people also um, for the agenda time tonight. I know we talked about a specific property, but it was merely more of a case study of how things are working and, and, and asking, you know, kind of hard questions because we just want to make sure that the way things are working are working the way we hope and expect they will. Because I think people look to the, the standard of Oxford. We have high standards in Oxford, and we just want to make sure that we live up to them. And I think in a Midwestern nice kind of way, we sometimes avert our eyes and we don't like, but I think sometimes you just have to ask hard questions. And when you're presented with the circumstances, hey, what's going on? So I appreciate the time and, and the openness to talk about it. I, I, I hope this is a was just kind of a beginning of a conversation to figure out what, what's working, what's not working, where are there additional resources needed, how do we get them, what are the legal mechanisms, so we just, we can do what we're, I think what the citizens expect we're doing. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanna thank David and Amber for joining me at the uh, county meeting uh, to discuss homelessness, and um, you know, I came away from the meeting realizing and being proud of the fact that I'm from Oxford. And I want to especially commend Jessica Green, who represented us at that meeting. Um, and it was clear to anyone with half a brain <laughs> that Jessica had her act together and Oxford had their act together. What is important to understand is that it can't just be Oxford who deals with the homelessness problem. Otherwise, we gain all the homeless people in the county. And it, I, I think some people have their heads in the sand. There were two township trustee members who said, oh, we don't have any homeless in our community. How do you know? And I, I just, that got me. Um, so I think it needs to be a county-wide process, and I'm glad that Cindy Carpenter, our commissioner, called for that meeting. I hope that the county takes this seriously and begins to figure out what we can do county-wide. Uh, I don't think that should deter us from doing the right thing, but uh, we can't do the, the work for the entire county. Anyway, I was very proud to be the mayor of the city of Oxford at that meeting. Um, I think the hour is getting late, and I suggest we adjourn this meeting. I would entertain such a motion. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. 
I think that was a second. That was kind of a second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Have a good evening.